All right, it is now time to introduce the next two speakers. They'll be speaking together. I'd like to introduce you to Larry Traeger and Dr. Chen Yi Liu, both from Aerojet Rocketdyne, and they're going to be discussing space station power systems. Larry, so wonderful to have you. Please begin. Thank you, yes. Uh, Yes, I'm uh, responsible for the power, advanced power systems business unit at Airjet Rocketdyne. Chang Yi Lu, Dr. Lu, is, is the chief technologist and a very, very versatile guy who came out of NASA many years ago. So uh, Chang will start off talking about the space station and some of the work we've done uh, with the space station. Uh, I'll also talk about some uh, radioisotope power systems, nuclear power systems that we're building. Uh, the current power sources for the rover up on Mars and some of the nuclear technology. But Chang will start off uh, talking about the space station and a little bit about our heritage of the, of the past. Go ahead, Chang. Okay, do you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, let's start from the beginning. And the, uh, as Larry mentioned about where I heard your rocket line and the next page, please. Next chart, please. Yeah. Thank you. This is the uh, all the Aerojet rocket die history, a lot of first. And uh, if you ask Larry, you know, which company you are working on, and he will tell you, well, I work on the company send the people to the moon. And that's correct. And the most of the Aerojet rocket die is the business on the propulsion and on the launch vehicle. So we can see here a lot of first ones and people they are everywhere in the, the low Earth orbit and to the moon. And over here, I did uh, the uh, circle of servos, which are also the, uh, the first in the area of the power system. First one definitely is uh, SNAP 10A because we have a her heritage about the uh, Atomic International. And that's the SNAP 10A, that's the first and the only the uh, space nuclear power into the space. This happened in 1965. And since then, and the, uh, we did a lot of nuclear the, uh, power history and the light hour show the uh, history, the uh, charts. And the, uh, then if you say, okay, the, how much the work the uh, LJ rocket line doing this, the, uh, the power system, and uh, we'll tell you we powered the whole uh, space Station National Lab, and we also are the, uh, the Mars Science Laboratory right now running on the Mars. So all these, the other two circles over there, Space Station now showing over here, and I will show to you the next one. And we also did the first the whole thruster, that's the electrical, the uh, propulsion, and the uh, why is part of the electrical power system, because there's a uh, power processing unit called the PPU, and that's turned to be is the power converters. So that's a part of what we call the power management and distribution system. Next chart, please. As I mentioned about, and the, the most of the LG rocket line is a concentrated on the SLS, Space Launch System, and use IS-25 thruster. Next. So from now on, I'm only concentrated on space power technology. First one, give everybody an uh, overview. Next. Who are we talking about the space power and the, uh, you need to study from energy source and from the sun, the solar energy, or from the nuclear. And the most of the nuclear, as you know, definitely will be the, uh, the artificial one and for the fission and the radioisotope. And we'll talk about both of this one and the radioisotope use the isotope plutonium 238 and generate the, the alpha particle. You start, you stop the alpha particle, the other one will convert to thermal and the thermal can produce the, uh, the uh, convert to the uh, power. So that's the, the energy source parts. Then you come to the power generation is a photovoltaic. You can use the solar dynamics the fuel cell and the, the uh, generate power primary battery also generate power from the, uh, the chemical engineer. And also the uh, dynamic power and the, the uh, convert the thermal into electricity. 
And then you have some more electrical, some semionics and tether. There's a lot of way to generate the power and you need to have an energy source, mostly from the thermal. Then you come to energy storage and the uh, like uh, the one which we're quite familiar with and the, the uh, lithium ion battery or the nickel hydrogen battery. Regenerative fuel cell also right now is very, the uh, cost a lot of attention because the, uh, uh, we are going back to the moon. And uh, then we will work on the flywheel, use dynamic uh, energy and uh, exchange with the, uh, uh, the uh, electricity, the capacitors and the supercapacitor also recently caused quite the attention to it. And otherwise we probably just store the, uh, the thermal then we'll convert to electricity later on and uh, do have several the application for terrestrial. So then come to the PMAT and uh, that's include the, uh, the power management and we we're talking about power management it's mainly about the power conversion, distribution, and the distributor, and also the uh, for power regulation. And if we want to complete the whole power system, we need to include the thermal management to the dump the waste heat. So the uh, the whole system include the, uh, you integrate the whole the uh, uh, energy power the uh, and all the storage together. And also you have uh, involved some of the, uh, the sawwheel and the, the, uh, the control, and you do all the modeling to predict and uh, the uh, performance of this the power system. So next, please. So if you look at the, the uh, one spacecraft channel, not specific for the, uh, for the uh, spatial, you know, you, if you say the, the um, um, you know, the uh, uh, geo satellites, and this is a NASA JPL chart, and the uh, roughly about 20 to 30 percent from the cost from the mass point of view. And what kind of technology you should use for the spacecraft really depends on several factors. What will be the power level? What will be the duration? Definitely, you only for one day mission is totally different than if you plan for 10 years mission. What will be the uh, the solar the energy will that be available and the, the uh, Leo will got uh, you know for the uh, for some the uh, uh, power and but if we go to Mars we probably only got the twenty five percent of it so that's why it definitely will be a consideration if we go further and definitely will be uh, the much less such as the uh, Jupiter will probably get two point five to three percent of the uh, solar energy and you expect your the solar array if you want to use that one to generate the power need to be about 30 percent the larger. So then the other one is space and we do experience some eclipse time and sometimes for some alone the uh, space of light probably can see the sun for the most of the time but if you are on the surface and then you probably need to prepare for your energy storage because somehow this the uh, the surface will partially see the sun and uh, sometimes they will not see the sun. And also we'll consider environmental constraints such as the uh, radiation, such as uh, micrometeor in the optical debris. And uh, for the Leo, you also consider the oxygen. Next. Okay, let's focus on solar for the time being, next. So uh, yeah, we are proudly um, spent more than 25 years on this International Space Station right now called the International Space Station National Lab. And uh, we build the, uh, the power system for the, uh, this uh, ISS NL. And uh, roughly speaking, we the above the, uh, the surface about 400 kilometer, the length and the waist is shown over here. And the information is interesting, you know, the, uh, it's a 51.64 degree because we try to accommodate the, the Russian launch site. So that means with this inclination, the solar beta can be up to about 75 degrees. So very short time, the, uh, we will see always be the sun, see the sun, even the, uh, uh, but for most of the time, and the, the uh, um, every orbit is about 93 minutes, but, among this one, about 35 minutes will be in the eclipse. 
The flu, uh, fully crude is about six. And the first launch is the um, uh, November 20th, 1998. That's the uh, Russian, the uh, uh, Zenia, the uh, uh, module uh, launch. American, the uh, module is called Unity Note 1, launched just the one week after. Next. So the uh, uh, space station, the power system is uh, right now, you know, for the last uh, many years, we still generate the most of the uh, power the, uh, in the space. And we also store the most energy in the space. And uh, the whole power system is designed for human the, uh, rated. And uh, that means we need to consider a lot of this, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the four tolerance. And it is the uh, EVA and the EVR, the uh, actual vehicle activities and the actual vehicle robotics, the maintainabilities. So it's a Leo spacecraft and that means the energy storage in the uh, uh, 35 minutes out of 93 minutes of it, you to be prepared for. So they are launched incrementally and operate continuously for right now over 19 years. Actually, we designed for 15 years. And the, uh, you can see the reliability is way over our original design goal. So the uh, quite a, a highly reliable power system. Don't mean we never get a failure. Yes, we did get a, the uh, several failures on the, uh, the power distribution unit, but we never stopped the uh, provide the power to the space station and the continuous running is the, uh, the space station. The, uh, we were capable about 100 kilowatts continuously. If you think about the, uh, uh, your household, probably about three to four kilowatts. The, uh, uh, even not the big case and may not be continuously. So you can see this, the 100 kilowatt continual power definitely can power more than 40, 50, the, uh, the household. And uh, uh, with the solar array at the 30 years ago, almost, the, uh, the when we first time about space station at that time. Sir, your slides are getting blocked. Hello? Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I don't know if other people are experiencing this, but there have been uh, gray rectangles that are on occasion blocking portions of your slide. Uh, that's correct. Okay, that one is gone. Okay, it's good. Thank you. So the uh, solar array and the generator, the uh, 262 kilowatt, even though at that time, as I mentioned about silicon cell, and it's about 14.2 to 14.5% efficiency. And right now we can get more than 30% efficiency. So at that time, the, uh, but even with not a lower efficiency, relatively speaking, we still generate 262 kilowatts at the beginning of our life. And with uh, 19 years ex experience, and uh, we roughly know the uh, solar array, silicon solar array, the uh, uh, degree the fit 1.5% to 2.4% depends on the lo location of the uh, um, relative to the uh, uh, space station because the is too close to the center and when shuttle come in and they do have a prune contamination on the solar array. And the energy storage about 421 kilowatts, that's probably the largest one ever, you know, in space. And we also deal with the high voltage, the, uh, um, the power system. So, okay, let's go to the next one. So there's a last box over there with found left the lower corner solar array and they use the screen shell units to control the solar array power flow, then the battery charge the charge unit to charge the battery. In the early days, we use nickel hydrogen battery. And the right now we use the lithium battery. Actually, the, uh, our company got a contract to finish this one. And uh, three thirds, uh, three quarters of the 24 lithium battery already on the space station and the power space station. The last success of the uh, lithium battery will be the uh, power on the uh, about the mid this year. So the, uh, that's roughly the energy storage. And uh, we mentioned about the PMAT that's starting from power distribution units, some we call switching unit. Sometimes we have the uh, power regulation or converter unit. And we also have the uh, RPCM, the remote power controller the, uh, module, 
actually the other one is trying to produce, uh, distribute the, uh, the power. And we do have several of the electronics, the controller, and we have a pump generator pump, and the two, the uh, um, drive list, the uh, ammonia coolant. So this the cool this the box, especially the uh, during early days, the nickel hydrogen battery is the major one which we need to use coolant to cool the uh, the energy storage system. And we also the uh, responsible to integrate the, this the uh, the we call the photovoltaic module radiator use the ammonia as the coolant. And this is uh, you can see almost the, the last box list over there. It's called plasma compact. And through the whole mission, and the uh, uh, because we have a huge array over there, so we need to balance this the uh, plasma the environment the uh, around this array. Try to balance that one, neutralize the other one to involve this arcing or the uh, ion sputtering. Let's go to the next page. Also, as mentioned about, and the uh, the requirements say. Yeah, at the year four, so people always say, "Why are you at the year four? That's just become a requirement." And the uh, uh, at the year four, and the requirements say one ninety three kilowatts. Actually, would generate about uh, almost seven percent more than what's the uh, list over here. So the solar array generally yeah, about is the uh, two hundred kilowatts or more. And the year four, and half of this one charge the battery, and the half the other one do uh, go to the, uh, the user. And during the 35 minutes eclipse time, then the solar region is very low power, and the battery provides the power for the whole system. Next. So you can see the size of this the solar array compared to Asuna, the alone over there. The size, the, we have eight wind. Each wind is about 34 meter times 12 meter the, uh, in the other size. And uh, you can see roughly in the middle of this photo, this a little bit broken the, uh, the panel over there. That's because the, uh, the P6, the uh, solar array, the originals is the uh, uh, stored on the, um, uh, in the middle of the st uh, station. And the light on the, the uh, fourth solar array, then move to the permanent location, it's a port side. And then they unfold the solar array. And during the unfolding, some kind of wire and the kind of peel off some portion of the uh, solar array. And it, since we have 82 panels just in one wing, so that's the power loss is very, very small. Next. Okay, this M battery, that's the, uh, our the, uh, very recent contribution to the space station and the, the uh, Previously, we used nickel hydrogen battery, roughly the same size, but it's nickel hydrogen battery is less efficient for the lithium battery. One box, we call the one of the repressed unit, is equivalent to nickel hydrogen, the uh, open. So at least the number listed over here, I think a significant number is about 10 years life. And the thing about the uh, for space station continuously, Every day you will experience the less than 16 orbiters of it. So that means every day you need to charge the charge 16 times around there. So for 10 years, tremendous number of charging discharge unit. And that's the beauty of a lithium battery. They do have a very long DS, the cycle life. So that uh, can stand due to the about 10 years life and for our Testing actually, we predict the life will be even longer than 10 years life. And over there, you can see the uh, some specific the uh, um, of this number we use the uh, GS USS the uh, um, lithium battery, and uh, it's about 134 the amp hour. And the uh, for that specific one, the uh, uh, it's quite a large, and we have 30 series to produce the voltage. Seems like I lost the my you lost the slide. Yeah. It's not under my control. So uh, somebody, somebody said it was blocking the screen so I, uh, we are restarting the slide. Okay, so um uh could we go to okay good yeah that's the chart. 
Uh, go down, please. Okay, so you can see a lot of the sensor over here, especially for the voltage and also for the temperature because the, as everybody know, this high room battery does susceptible to the thermal run. That's the concern from the safety point of view. So there's a lot to monitor, try to make sure the situation, the thermal runway will not concur. So you can see the uh, uh, last the, uh, the sensor there, and also we have a bypass tree in case the one of this uh, 30 cell is the male function. Next. So the showing over here, and the, the uh, it's used at uh, Japan. This company is called GS US Cell, and uh, they are JAXA, and they launch this one through the HTV to the space station. You can see a lever down the back, and they in this the external pattern. Next. So the uh, uh, roughly speaking, and uh, previously mentioned about six lithium battery for one module, we have a four module, repress 12 nickel hydrogen battery. You can see the energy density definitely is the uh, double better than nickel hydrogen battery. Next. Uh, the, the first one happened, and the, the, uh, that's the uh, S4, the battery, have a two the, uh, EVA. But prior to the EVA, actually Roba already mounted the whole, took out the previous the, uh, nickel hydrogen battery, and the mounted this the new lithium battery. That's happened in 2017, and the two EVA to complete the whole work. And the EVA the, uh, uh, with Asuna is mainly trying to the, uh, connect this the circuitry. So two EVA will do the job. So this is the 4S4 in 2017. And the next one is a P4, which they did the uh, uh, early previous year, 2019. And then the third one, next page, the third one is a little bit challenging because the uh, P6 and it's a, a little bit further away. So the, uh, the they call the SS RMS, that's the uh, the space station, remove the manipulator system, cannot switch to that far away. So they cannot use the uh, robot to repress the, the battery. So they need uh, the uh, EVA to move over there and try to move the older battery and repress the, with the new battery. So for the P6 and uh, some kind of the uh, uh, incident happened. So it took them about five EVA to complete the, uh, the whole world mission. And uh, right now it's running, provided the uh, power to the uh, space station. Runs very well. So next place. Okay, before I go to the nuclear power, I'd like to the, uh, kind of introduce and probably know the Artemis the program. And the goal is 2024, go to South Pole, the, the first the boot on the, uh, on the moon. And uh, maybe because of this pandemic, and they may have some the, uh, postponed, but at least the, uh, the chart, which I got two months ago, still be planned to go to the, uh, the moon by 2024. And uh, the roadmap will be in the next, next chart, please. So you can see, there's a four step. The uh, first one and the early South Pole, the uh, crater ring mission, try to measure if we go to South Pole. And that's the last the, uh, crater over there. If we are standing the ring of the craters, how much sun we can see, of course, the, the, the strength of the sun, the uh, capacity of the sun's, the uh, solar and it still be the same, but the, uh, um, you know, on the moon, as we know, the, if we go to equator, the, uh, we will see 354 hours of the, the eclipse time. And uh, at the South Pole, theoretically, we probably can see quite a continuous sun because of these the craters. And even though we can pick at the, the best location of the rain, and the, sometimes the sun just moving horizontally back and forth, but sometimes the uh, other rain of the crater will block your view. So that's, you need a lot of study. And up to right now, I think the, uh, the best the way which they can es estimate depends on the heights above this ring. And the, uh, they can see about 
you know, reduce their 354 hour down to about 65 or 64 hour of the eclipse time. And you can see that was tremendous. They save all the energy storage, the uh, uh, system mass and the cost of air. So that's the first thing probably would do. Then this is a commercial, the, uh, the lunar payroll surfaces. And we know there's uh, many com small company come out through the, uh, of course, you know, some companies not small, such as Lockheed Martin. And they do the, uh, uh, have this opportunity to win this, the, uh, the uh, seeker. And uh, the next one is the large scale cargo landing, then followed by the human on the moon. Next. Okay, so let's look at a possibility the power technology will apply for the, the uh, uh, moon surface. And in the early days, just like a power program, probably three kilowatt power will be sufficient because they only stay about 6.5 days. As I mentioned about, you probably can continue to see the um, um, longer than 17, 18 days at the south pole, the uh, crater, the ring of a crater. So some kind of solar array probably can do the job uh, with the, uh, some portion of the, power, of the batteries. So that would be good enough. And we just need to be careful. Environment may have some, and we need to articulate the, the uh, to track the sun. That's, that's not a big the idea over there. But if we try to do sustain the power or stay on the moon, either at the South Pole or North Pole or even equator, now we need to think about how we provide the least the energy storage, and of course. Regenerative fuel cell is a good option over there, but still need a lot of mass if we really want to go to, to uh, survive this the 354 hours of eclipse time. So then we need to think about the uh, nuclear power. So we're starting from now, we'll spend most of our time going through the nuclear power. As I mentioned about, nuclear power have two kinds. One is radioisotope and which probably generate no more than about one kilowatts. And uh, the, uh, we know Apollo 17 do have the uh, um, RTG sitting on the moon. So it's not new. And we do use the uh, MMR RTG. I will go to the next page to, uh, to power this the Mars Science Laboratory. Then we probably will need to the, uh, bring back uh, at least the uh, uh, the fission power, and uh, this time it's different, it's not for space, but for the surface application. If we are successfully can use for the moon, definitely we'll use the same technology for the moon. Next. Hey Chang, Chang I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about the radio isotope stuff and then you okay. can come back in. Okay, yeah, so next chart please. Thank you. Uh, just, a, just a side note here, uh, we were part of many companies, so we are part of Rockwell, Boeing, uh, United Technologies, and now Aerojet acquired us uh, several years ago. But uh, the space station was built when we were part of the Boeing days. This, uh, this is a multi-mission radioisotope generator. It's nuclear powered. And uh, what it means is it can operate in the vacuums of space on the surface of a planet. That's the beauty of this technology. There are no moving parts, which makes it great. It's the only TRL-9 generator, nuclear power generator flying in space today. This particular unit, uh, Powering uh, Curiosity, has eight general purpose heat source bricks. Uh, they use lead telluride tags for the thermoelectric couples. Um, and you can see the, the delta T is about 300 degrees C. A beginning of life power, 110 watts. Uh, and as Chang mentioned, you know, this is a real small power source, but the beauty of it is plutonium 238, which has a half life of 87.7 years. So it just keeps going forever. Let's, uh, I think we're getting a little behind. So let's move to the next chart, please. This is the uh, rover. Uh, the uh, Curiosity rover was launched uh, November 26th in 2011. It uh, landed on the surface of Mars. I, I'm sure everybody got to see that landing in the Gale Crater. Uh, it landed August 6, 2012. Uh, so it's been on the surface uh, for almost eight years this August. Uh, eight Earth years. However, uh, it, it really stopped uh, functioning. It'll keep going forever, but in terms of the mission, the mission was planned for two years. 
uh, I think it was in 2018 is when it stopped uh, stopped actually communicating back and forth. But uh, it's it's really been a tremendous power source for for the rover. And this is the same power source that will be used for the launch coming up July 17th. We're going back to Mars again. So it's the the uh, Mars 2020 mission. Let's go to the next chart, please. So uh, the the beauty of what we're doing as a company, we're involved with the, the MMRTG. And then there's something we're working on, it's called the enhanced version of this. It's basically the same architecture, but we're gonna swap out the thermoelectric couples. And that will generate a beginning of life power of about 150 watts. And then following that, we're also involved in a competitive uh, nature with something called the next generation RTG. And then, and then we're also involved with dynamic power systems. So, so we get the full gamut of systems here. Uh, the uh, the F2 unit, we built three flight units as part of the original contract. The F2 unit was, uh, was, is, is now uh, uh, delivered to Kennedy Space Center. They're going through the final fit checks uh, this next week. Uh, and, and it's a very high uh, priority for NASA to launch. So, so far we hear everything's a go. Um, let's see, the Dragonfly was selected uh, as a mission and that will use we may use our flight unit three, or we may build another one. Uh, Applied Physics Lab, Johns Hopkins is interested in some, some minor changes. So uh, that, that mission will launch in April of 2026, at least that's the target. And, uh, and so Saturn is a, uh, is a gas giant, as you know, and Titan is, uh, is the largest moon. Uh, so Titan has some very interesting hydrocarbon uh, environment that you know, carbon rich uh, atmosphere has nitrogen and methane and liquid water and ammonia so so this this uh, picture as you can see it will be what it looks like and it will be exploring this the, the uh, surface to, to check out the environment and so forth uh, the Titan night is eight Earth days so uh, it will not be flying at night but it'll be just during the uh, during the day uh, let's go to the next page um, so next gen RTG. So the beauty of this power source is that um, it can deliver 400 watts, maybe a little more of, of power. And that's a really tremendous advantage for the scientists and NASA. Uh, we're looking at an efficiency of 10 to 14 percent and the specific power 6 to 8, kilo, uh, six to eight watts per kilogram. And, and you can see the comparison to the MMRTG, which is only 2.8. So so this is really, uh, really uh, the state of the art technology and we're right in a position, uh, we're competing in this one. And like I say, it's a uh, very exciting times for us. Let's go to the next page. So uh, Chang is actually a, a program manager for one of these. There's three, uh, three uh, dynamic power sources that we're exploring right now that NASA is exploring. Uh, one is the uh, AMSC system. Uh, and, and these are all, uh, uh, you know, they don't, they have, some of these have the moving parts like the Sterling. Sun Power has a, a gas bearing piston generator. And, and the difficulty with that is that, you know, it's got to last for 15, 16 years. So you have these gas bearing pistons going in and out, which actually uh, is, makes it very difficult, complicated technology. Chang, you want to comment at all on this? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, uh, we'll for, for the, uh... Yeah, an American superconductor is called a yeah, fracture-based isotope studying converter. That's the first one. Second one is totally different technology. Corali used the turbo brightening cycle the, uh, of converters. So the third one is also the uh, sterling the, uh, converter by SunPower. They call the SunPower robust the uh, sterling converters. So the uh, Larry mentioned about the major difference between the first one and the third one. One's used the fracture bearing and the other one used the gas bearing. Yeah, next. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about nuclear power. Go, uh, keep going. Next chart, please. And then one more chart, please. Next chart, thank you. Yeah, this is just a, a real quick pictorial of, of our extensive uh, experience. We are the, the only, believe it or not, uh, we're the only uh, U.S. company to ever launch a nuclear reactor in space, space and that was a SNAP-10A, and that was in, uh, I believe, June of 1965. Uh, the, the power level of that was only about 500 watts. 
and uh, it, it lasted, I think the mission lasted something like three months or so. And uh, the controller, there was a, uh, issues with the radiation environments and the controller failure and so forth. But you can see the vast uh, uh, different types of technologies we've been involved with. Uh, SP Prime, the multi-megawatt, uh, the Prometheus, and Jupiter icy moons, we were involved with that. Uh, a lot of these programs were canceled. They started uh, and then they were canceled. Jimmo, uh, some of you probably worked on that. Uh, that was certainly 100 kilowatts electric, uh, big power, uh, but, uh, but the budget was uh, so, so high for that that the NASA decided to, to cancel. I keep saying that'll come back someday. But uh, then the other is FSP, fission surface power. We're excited about that technology. We believe that there's a huge opportunity there with, uh, with uh, e either or organic ranking or, or also the kilopower, which uh, I got to see the uh, demo uh, three, two or three years ago at the Nevada nuclear test site. So it's exciting technology. Let's go to the next page. And this is just, uh, Chang put this chart Yeah, okay, again. yeah. Th this is the uh, NASA chart. Let me go through it quickly. The, uh, so you can see the fishing reactor can have two application. One is on the surface. And there's uh, two study. One is about 13 years ago, 2007, and uh, estimate that the uh, about 10, actually at that time it's 40 kilowatts, and the uh, uh, estimate cost is about 1.4 billion. And uh, recently, as the uh, Larry mentioned about kilo power demonstrate, and they estimate that the cost is about 400 million. And uh, the power level is a little bit different, but the uh, definite 10 kilowatts the maxima for the kilopower will be sufficient for the lunar application. So that's the first application for the fishing power is called the fishing surface power. The second one is called uh, the, uh, the nuclear electrical propulsion. And uh, that's the previously, uh, also Larry mentioned about GMO program go to the uh, Jupiter. So at that time and the, uh, the TIL technology readiness level is a little bit low and uh, the moderate one about 100 kilowatts and the highest one go to the almost uh, multi megawatts and uh, use a very high temperature and you will expect that the account to be the nuclear program is the material the uh, demonstration program so the uh, that the TR is quite low so they have a two major application and we know the uh, quickly and if we want to sustain the, the lunar stay that the uh, uh, fishing surface power, it will be needed. Next. So this is uh, the uh, Larry mentioned about kilopower curiosity, and they demonstrate that one, and the, uh, at one kilowatts will real reactors, and they, uh, they use the uh, uh, reflector, also use a controller, and the, uh, uh, for the reactor module, and also power converter units. That's the uh, use the study engine that did not turn all the study engine on. They use a sterling engine. Each one is about 120 watts and they have a of that one which have a capable to generate the one kilowatts. But one kilowatts may not be sufficient for more application the, uh, uh, for 2028 stay over there. So we probably need about 10 kilowatts and uh, probably we need about 24 the uh, studying engine. And the number of the study engine um, is quite a many, 24, definitely each one probably 400 to 450 watts. Uh, that's beauty over there, just like the solar array. If you have a one cell, uh, one engine is out, it doesn't you know, affect too much about your the, uh, power capabilities. Next. Okay, that's the uh, uh, technology and uh, which energy rocket is ready. And, uh, you know, starting from the, uh, the, we go button up and for different uh, material. And that's right now, energy rocket is not the nuclear power, the uh, uh, company anymore, but we do have some heritage for shielding, for the material, for the thermal management, for the uh, power converter, for the radiator, which the, uh, during the GMO time, we developed is the titanium water heat pipe radiator. We also use the, uh, the potassium heat pipe for transport the, the heat from the, uh, uh, the high temperature location to the uh, uh, transport that heat to for the power generation. So next. 
Hey, Chang, I'll, I'll, I'll get off the stage yeah. here. I think this yeah, is our last chart. But I, I just want to say, uh, Chang and I have been really blessed to work at Rocketdyne for many, many years. And, you know, uh, Rocketdyne is really known for building rocket engines. And we built the engines that sent Neil Armstrong to the moon. We built the space shuttle made engine. But Chang and I have worked in the power side of it. So you can see we have pretty diversified business space. But we talked about the radioisotope power systems. Plutonium-238 is the best radio radioisotope that we can find. That, you know, Chang's done a lot of research trying to look at the different radioisotopes. That's the one, but it's also extremely expensive. Uh, and, and so there's a new uh, discovery uh, announcement coming in January. So there's four, uh, there's four missions that have been selected. I think uh, one of them is to, uh, to IO, EO, one of them is to, uh, uh, to Triton, to Nep Nep Neptune, the moon of uh, Neptune. And then there's uh, also, uh, there's one to uh, uh, Da Vinci, I believe. I, um, there, there's three different uh, planets they're looking to go to. So we're involved with all of that. Um, right now, uh, you know, we're trying to improve uh, what, what, what NASA wants is more efficiency, the, the more efficient use of the plutonium-38, and also more power. So those are the two things that we're focused on. Then you've got the surface power. And, uh, and NEP is certainly uh, uh, an area that we think is a, a poised for growth. If you're gonna go to Mars, ultimately the goal is to go to Mars. Nuclear has gotta be the only way to get there. If you talk to any of the astronauts, they'll tell you, you know, getting there by solar is not gonna work. Uh, and so, so with our propulsion capability and our Redmond facility up in Washington, uh, definitely the thruster systems and the PPU, Chang talked about that. And then coupled with uh, the, uh, the nuclear, uh, some of the stuff we're working on nuclear using the SNAP technology would give us a pretty good uh, uh, go, go forward with nuclear electric propulsion. Our company is also involved in NTP, nuclear thermal propulsion. So, uh, so we've got a lot of uh, history and leverage. Uh, we're going to leverage that and try to find out where the where the business goes right now it's there it's difficult to say whether ntp is going to win out or or whether it will be some form of fission fission power but in the end right now uh, uh you know nuclear will be a player in the future so with that uh chang any other concluding comments no i think that that's about it and uh, we'll have a one more chance that's the uh the the business we still work on the space the uh, the power the next one yep Okay, so any questions? I saw five over here. Any questions? Okay. Let's look through some of the questions. Um, there is one on nuclear power for only, only thermal heat and electrical power or propulsion. Um, feel free to jump in here if you ask that question and expand on that. Oh, this is from Santosh Kumar. Yeah, can you repeat the question? Well, it says nuclear power only for thermal, for heat, and electrical power or propulsion. I can, not, I can expand on that. I don't what the question. Basically, what I want to know is, is the nuclear power strictly to generate heat for the purposes of electrical power generation and or heat? or can it be used for propulsive effects, which ultimately would be heat as well to heat a propellant, because ultimately we got to eject stuff out the back or whatever, or for a reaction control system. So I want to know if it has any applications beyond just the electrical power generation and just keeping it warm. That's correct. I, actually, you know, the, uh, the previous charts on the last charts, they, we definitely did a work on called the nuclear thermal propulsion. If you remember almost, well, okay, sorry. Yeah, 60 years ago, we, the company, the LJ, at that time, the uh, work on nerve the, uh, program, that's exactly the nuclear thermal propulsion. Just use hydrogen, goes to the nuclear, get all the heat and the, the repair out, and get all this the ISP up to about 900 seconds. Yes, we are working on this one. So currently it's only for the first two, but the propulsion aspect of it is still under research and development. Yes, it's still being the, you know, the, uh, either the uh, DOD and also the uh, NASA were interesting about this one. 
And uh, since they can get up to, as I mentioned, about twice the, the uh, uh, ISV compared to chemical, the uh, propylene. So definitely would be a good option. And uh, with this one used for human or used for cargo? For cargo, for sure. For human, be possible. So it uh, really depends on how soon you want to get there. And the um, uh, 900 definitely will help compared to the, chem the chemical one. Sure. In terms of electrical power generation, the way that electrical power, of course, is done here on Earth with nuclear reactors is that, I mean, the thing might as well be a coal burning power plant. You don't care. Nuclear power is just a heat source to heat up the steam. You drive a turbine, and then therefore you drive the electrical uh, power that way. But in the case of this, are you doing it through an intermediary heat uh, stage first to electrical, or is it doing something uh, with regards to the electrons or whatever, obviously you protons and neutrons? Uh, emission, but is it going direct? Is it going directly to electrical uh, from the nuclear, or is it using a heat stage in between, such as what we do on Earth with, uh, you know, with steam and turbines? Well, okay. Actually, you know, the uh, uh, when we apply this NTP nuclear thermal proportion, and uh, then this uh, called a bimodal. Yeah, if you look at the website, you probably can find some information. And our company work on the other one. That means we have two reactors you know, try to be combined into one, but it seems like the, uh, uh, have a two separate one, probably is even easier. One of the reactor generate the power, one you know, the uh, reactor do this, the nuclear thermal propulsion. So the that's for the propulsion, but what about for the uh, electrical power? Uh, for that's what I mentioned power. about this, uh, you use the, uh, another nuclear re reactor to generate the power. Usually we are not go through since the, the coolant and what we use, use a high, either gas coolant or liquid metal coolant, or just use the heat pipe as the uh, previous we presented for the, um, for the, uh, the uh, kilo power. We just use a heat pipe to bring out the heat. Of course, for megawatts or 100 kilowatts, heat pipe may not be practical. Then we can use the gas to get it, go into the reactor, carry out the heat, then drive at least the Brighton cycle and the two general electricities. Sterling cycle probably is good, lower than 100 kilowatts. If you want to go higher than 100 kilowatts, the brightness cycle will be the necessary, yeah. I guess what I'm getting at is that, are, there, are you guys going through any sort of a mechanical phase before it gets to electrical, or are you guys using some sort of ionic thing going on from the nuclear? Oh, yes, you have a choice. You can either go with the, the thermoelectrical, semionics, and the Brighton cycle, Sterling cycle. So the yeah, choice over there, and the, uh, uh, if you go to mechanical, Brighton cycle, Sterling cycle, definitely work. And all you use the uh, static, the, uh, use the thermal electrical or semionic. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there are other questions. Do we have time for a few other questions, Ken? It's up to you. We have Dr. Potter in the waiting. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity, so maybe take one, one or two more. Okay, let's okay. do two more questions. There's one here from Giovanni on the Lion um, batteries. What did it happen? What happened to the old batteries they replaced on the lithium ion, ion batteries? What happened to the old batteries they replaced? Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, the old battery, nickel hydrogen battery, and uh, almost two thirds, probably more than two thirds, up to about three quarters, just the uh, uh, disposed. That means when just disposed and uh, they will burn out when they enter it to the earth. And about a quarter of the the uh, nickel hydrogen battery, they just put it back. As I mentioned about, you have a two ORU to form the one battery. Previously, I have a two nickel hydrogen. And the right now, one will be sufficient. But the, uh, uh, the other one, you still need to connect the circuitry. So either you put a jumper over there, or you just put back the uh, nickel hydrogen. And the, the whole program decide for one third to about quarter of the level, they put back at least the, uh, the nickel hydrogen battery to finish our connectivity and also serve as the backup. Hey Chang, just to also comment that the one lithium ion battery that we built replaces two of the, the nickel no, hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So once we when, once we remove this nickel hydrogen, the as I mentioned about you know 66 hours, 
So 75% of the, the uh, nickel hydrogen battery were disposed and burned out. And uh, we still maintain about the 20 to 30% of the nickel hydrogen battery put it back to the uh, uh, next to the nickel hydrogen battery, just in case you know the uh, uh, nickel hydrogen doesn't function as what we designed to. Then this nickel hydrogen battery can provide the uh, uh, backup power. Yeah, one other comment quickly. I know they're strapped for time, but the lithium ion batteries are definitely the battery management system, the BMS that we designed and built, really uh, drives a lot more efficiency out of the batteries. And the old batteries were just they, you know they. They ran out of steam. They, you know, they had used their their useful life. So, uh, all in all, it's been a really good good thing. And uh, th those batteries we use, Chang mentioned GSU also. Those are large format cells. The cells that we're building now for uh, our current contract for Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser are the small. It's the eighteen six fifty cells, the smaller cells. So, we happen to use the large format cells for the batteries for the space station, which is interesting. And, um, you know, so. Any other things, Chang, before we move on? No, I, I think that's good. Actually, you know, the uh, um, next time we probably can talk more about the power on the space station, including the lithium ion battery. All right. Well, thank you so much, Larry and Dr. Chang. There are some questions that are still left in the chat room. If you'd like to answer them directly there, you can type those in or they can send you questions to your emails. Thank you again for your program. Thank you. We enjoyed it. Thank you. All Take right. 